our feet. We're going to sing songs of gratefulness, thankfulness to the only one true wise God. If you do me a favor, put your hands together like this. Come on. He's worthy of the praise. Yes, you are. Come on, repeat after me. We're going to sing Yahweh.
every song we could ever sing You're worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name And Jesus, the only one who could ever say For you're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you sing this out church come on in holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show Lord, we say, worthy of every song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, and you're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them
just open up our hands in the posture of receiving. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. God's promise is that if we be still, we would know that He is God. There's something about just centering ourselves underneath the holiness of the Lord. God, we make room for you to move in this moment. Come and fill us again. thanksgiving in your courts with praise seeking nothing else but your face saying we want to know your glory we want to see you and we want to know you God we love you with every fiber of our being Lord would you be exalted in this place and your word says that when you've been lifted up from the earth that you would draw all men to yourself. God, thank you that wholeness and peace and life and love comes only from your presence. We drink from that well today. We pray all these things in Jesus' name and everybody said amen and amen. For surely the Lord is in this place and we do serve a holy, holy God church. Why don't you do me a favor? Greet a couple people around you, maybe even cross an aisle, meet somebody new. Let's love on one another and you may be seated. Oh, Westwood, it is so, so good to worship with you. What a special time this morning. I know for me, it was just, uh, just beautiful. Uh, and if you want to keep worshiping with us, we actually have a United in Praise worship night happening tomorrow night right here at the Woodside Room, actually, just down the hall, but here at the Chan Hassan campus. And it's going to be just a wonderful evening of worship, of prayer. We're going to get to hear stories of what God is doing near and far through the ministries that we're a part of. So I hope you're going to join us. It's happening 630 Woodside Room tomorrow night. Definitely want to see you there. Well, if we haven't met, my name is Heather, and I serve as our director of Here, Near, and Far. And uh, it's just good to be with all of you this morning. I don't know about you, but I think Minnesota dialed up the best of the West we could have. I mean, like, I don't know if you felt it, but we were outside all day yesterday, and it was just awesome. And today's going to be another beautiful one. So thanks for taking time out of your beautiful weekend to be with us here this morning. Um, we'd love to help you be able to get connected with things that are going on at Westwood. And to do that, the best possible way is to sign up for the weekly. It's an email that just jumps into your email in inbox on Sunday mornings, and it gives you activities that are coming up and different ministries and opportunities to serve uh, and to get involved over the next several weeks 
week. So go ahead and sign up for the weekly. You can do that with the QR code or on our website, and that will get you connected with the community here at Westwood. You know, one of the things that we are so, so grateful for is the generosity that happens at this church because it is your giving that truly makes ministry happen. And I just want to share this past Friday night, because of your generosity, we were able to host a respite night. And it was a night for families with kids of special needs so that those kids and their siblings could be taken care of while their parents get a much deserved night out. And so the kids were able to play games, they ate pizza, they did crafts, and they had a blast here while their parents got some time off. We were able to serve 39 kids through that, 14 different families. So I just really appreciate, we want to say thank you for your generosity because it is through your giving that things like that can happen here at Westwood. God is on the move through this church. And, and if you came prepared to give a gift today, you can do that through the QR code on the screen. You can do it online. We have giving boxes. Um, but just thank you. Thank you for helping um, Westwood be able to be the church that serves our community and serves our families. We just are so grateful for you. Today, we are moving on to the second of our sermon series, Why Is There Pleasure? Back last week, Pastor Ben Griffin kicked us off with a message on that, and today we have Pastor Joel here, and he is going to be talking to us about the beauty of friends. And so let's take this message in together. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us online at Bush Lake and uh, West Tonka. I'm glad that you're here on our campus in Chan at um, just a great time of the year and I think a great series. I'm really inspired by this series. I've been excited about it since I first um, outlined it last summer and inspired because of the words of G.K. Chesterton. I was reading a book and he was um, a 19th century Christian apologist and philosopher doing debates with atheists who always had the same tension related to the problem of pain. If there's so much suffering in the world, how does a loving God not deal with that more intentionally? And he brought, Chesterton did the inverse of that question to say, well, um, then you have to give equal obligation to explain why is there pleasure. If the problem of pain is there, the problem of pleasure must be addressed. And Christian faith gives us the clues to the mystery of pleasure as well as the problem of pain, unlike any other faith can do. And so I thought that inspired me. I want to do a series. I have never heard a series just focused on pleasure. In fact, in the history of the church, wouldn't you agree with this? When it comes to pleasure, we we tend to put a spotlight on the shadow side of pleasure, not the sunny side of pleasure. And so we start to think of everything that's wrong with pleasure instead of everything that's good. What if we did a series that just spoke to what is good about pleasure? Can you see why I'm excited about it? And I can tell you are too. So why is there pleasure? Just again, an update on the series, The Beauty of Nature. Last week, Ben did an amazing job, by the way. I was on a mountain in Arizona while he was preaching that message cheering him on all the way. It was fantastic. Today is going to be the beauty of friends. Next week is the beauty of sexual intimacy. We could procreate without pleasure. Why does pleasure complement it? It's a good question. By the way, this is a PG-13 kind of message. And so if you have kids with you, I just want to say, great, just be prepared for questions after the service next week. <laughs> and then week number four is the beauty of generosity. Why does it just feel so good to give? And then week number five, the beauty of food, which this week you'll be interested for this is going to be on May 5th. We are interviewing um, the Twin Cities famous chef, David Fima. And he's going to be part of the service that day. And we're going to talk about the pleasure of food and why does it bring so much pleasure? Can you see why I was excited about this series? So we're jumping into it and it's important that we do because there's just appealing beauty to friendship. As I'm getting a little older in my life, and I'm cool with that, my life is getting simpler. And the things that are most important are getting prioritized. And top of that list would have to be friendship. 
Friendships just mean so much to me. I think they always have. I mean, we've always turned to friends. Don't we always turn to friends? I mean, when I was in junior high and high school and wanted to play sports, I turned to friends. When I went off to college um, and I was studying for exams, I would turn to friends, specifically smart friends, because <laughs> I was wise. And then, you know, when, when I advance and I'm, I'm looking for work, I turn to friends. When I'm dealing with doubt in my life, wondering about my future, where am I going, or relationships, I turn to friends. When I'm bored, I would turn to friends. When I started Westwood, I turned to friends. When I want to have fun, I turned to friends. Yesterday, I had breakfast with a friend a great friend. Afterwards, I came out of the restaurant. It was off of Highway 5, and to my surprise, there's a group of, I don't know, 12, 13, 14, um, 10-year-old boys, 11-year-old boys, right in that, they're, they're a crowd. And they're on Highway 5, and they're doing this with a lot of enthusiasm, which means <laughs> honk. And so cars are flying by, and those who didn't honk, they booed them. And those who did honk, I mean, they jumped like they were on a trampoline with each other. I mean, such energy, they were with friends. Friends are so important. When do you turn to friends? And do you? Because the statistics are a little alarming in terms of the lost art of friendship and the increased challenge of loneliness. Um, two out of three Americans are dealing with a heightened measure of loneliness, struggling with cultivating friendship today. I came across an article about the United Kingdom, and the parliamentary priority really surprised me. There's such an epidemic of loneliness in the UK right now, they have created a position called the Minister of Loneliness to help reduce it. So I guess I don't come in with the assumption as I did when I was in my youth, that we all have friends that we turn to. But if you do have such a friend, who is that friend? And I'm not speaking about a spouse specifically because that may be a friend. I'm thinking about the reality that a man does need a man friend and a woman does need a woman friend. That's not just a fun friend, let's have a party, let's make cars honk together. No, I'm talking about a genuine personal presence of a friend in your life, do you have that? A dear friend of mine gave me some keen insight. He said, some friends are for a season, some friends are for a reason, and some friends are for a lifetime. That's some good insight. Friends come and go. They have different roles. But I would like to add to that, some, some friends are for your soul. And I think that's kind of fallen off the radar. So honestly, when it was coming, a little like Ben last week, the subject of nature was so big, so was the subject of friendship. But I want to narrow the field in my time allotment to deal with soul friends, the deepest element of expression because we need it, we want it, we may not have it, we may not know how to look for it, and I'll address that a little bit later in the message. If you would like to, I, I've addressed friendship on multiple fronts, and uh, I did a friendology series, it was called um, a few years ago, and I talked about uh, the reality that some friends are subtractors, some are dividers, some are adders, and some are multipliers. Can I just encourage you to go to our homepage in the search window there, just put friendology, that series will come up, it's four weeks, you have a lot of good wisdom, practical, fun, on uplifting perspective of friend um, and how important they are, but I really want to go to this issue of soul friendship because so we rarely do, and yet it is our need. And I was reminded that of even this week because I was part of a retreat experience. I was at a table of 10, half women and half men, and the question was on spiritual health. What makes a church healthy? What makes a leader healthy? And I introduced this concept of soul friends. It captured their attention. I explained soul friendship a little like I'm gonna do with you today. And then I paused and I said, could we take a moment? Because it got kind of quiet. I said, could we just go around and would you just say, yes, I have a soul friend, or no, I don't, but want to. And we did. I had a wrong assumption. I thought men, and I thought this message would be specifically related to men, and I was mistaken in that, because I think men struggle with soul friendships, intimacy with other guys in an appropriate way where we're sharing our, our souls freely, transparently with each other. I think I've always assumed women just do that naturally, maybe because I have five sisters, and I go, wow. <laughs> they do it naturally from my perspective, but not all women do. Out of the 10, six out of the 10 do not have a soul friend. Took my breath away. 
And can I tell you, half of them had tears because the aching in their heart was to have a soul friend. They go, we need to give energy and attention to soul friends because it's very biblical. In fact, you find that Moses had Aaron. Naomi had Ruth. You find Paul had Timothy. Jesus had John. In fact, one of the most intimate scenes of the Bible is in the Last Supper experience. And remember, John leans his head into the chest of Jesus. He says, like he's hearing the heartbeat of the Son of God. There's an intimacy, a soul connection that was filling up John with pleasure in that moment. Um, and then you have the famous story, of course, of David and Jonathan. And what a story that is. When we think of friendship, we think of them. And 1 Samuel kind of gives some perspective. After David had finished talking with Saul, Saul was the king, and Saul wanted to take David out, wanted to kill him. His son was Jonathan. Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his self. You, you already get a glimpse of the power of what it means to have a soul friend. And I don't think it was for David and Jonathan alone. I think God intended that to be for all of us, that there's a knowability that they knew each other, they knew each other's secrets, that there's a loyalty. I will walk with you, I will stick with you, I will help you keep on keeping on. That's a soul friend. And there's more to a soul friendship as well. But it's biblical. So we have a call to be soul friends. I, I feel like I need to take a moment and at least define soul because it's such an abstract term, but it really deals with your inner self, the, the important part of who you are in every expression. Yes, we have a body. We have a context. We have a career. We have a family. We have a community. We have this body, but a soul integrates the whole of, yes, the body, but the mind and the will to the very core of our identity. I love Dallas Willard's definition of soul. I'll just tell you, it's a little over the top. It's not long, but it's interesting. This is what he says. Our soul is an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. I bet you would use that with all of your friends when it comes to defining soul, but really an unceasing spiritual being. It's your inner self with an eternal destiny. It's your eternal you, but now. Your soul needs to be blessed now. Don't wait for that eternal destiny out there. Your soul needs connection now. And the pleasure of life is experience expanded in manifest ways when we find that kind of relationship. So my message really, quite honestly, is you were made for friendship. You were made for friendship. And when you step into the friendship that God intends for us, you give proof to the very existence of God in how you friend each other. So let's just look at some of the proofs to that. There's the Trinitarian proof. Father, Son, Holy Spirit working together in community, in relationship. It says in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Speaking about the power of this Trinitarian expression. The Greek word logos that we translate word into English is good and fitting and right, but there's another um, translation of logos that I have shared several times because I think it's so important and I share it again, and that's relationship. Read it that way. In the beginning was the relationship, and the relationship was with God, and the relationship was God. That is, God doesn't want us to simply know about him. He wants us to know him. He wants us to experience friendship with him. That friendship is part of his invitation for us in life that brings so much pleasure in our journey. Or you think of even the beginning in Genesis chapter two, and God says to Adam, it is not good for man to be alone, that he intended us to be in a relationship, not just rah, rah, fun time kinds of relationship, in soul relationships, and that's where I wanna go. I wanna give this invitation and this challenge. Would you take a next step and grow your faith by cultivating a soul friend? Some of you may have one. After my experience last week in the retreat setting, I'm going to assume half of you want it but don't have it. How do you get it? I'll address that at the end. I want to first give shape a little bit more in depth to what a soul friend looks like. Would you join me in this challenge? You with me? Yeah, okay. Are you with me? Yes. 
It's a beautiful day. I'm expecting just a little bit more here, guys. Be with me on this. Here we go. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Jesus calls his friend. Now that should put tears in your eyes. Jesus calls you friend. And then he gives four proofs for friendship in one little text. I'm just going to touch on each of them briefly. The first proof of friendship is this, what I do for you. And what Jesus does, it seems unspeakable, as we read in John 15, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Now, he shares this with his friends, the disciples, the Thursday night before the Friday when he's going to be crucified. They're still in the um, afterglow of Palm Sunday victory where the crowds are cheering, clueless to the fact that the crowds will crucify him shortly. And Jesus knows what they don't know. And he puts this before them. He's shaping their understanding of the cross and what they're going to see. And they won't believe what they're going to see. It's still difficult for us with that cross. And he's shaping their understanding. So I guess a good question is, how do you view the cross? When I say, what does the cross mean to you? What does it look like to you? What comes to your mind? What's the first word that comes to you? For many people, it would start off to say it represents death and suffering for our sin. And that's true. But what's the why behind him sharing this, this beautiful truth about giving his life? He wants us to look at the cross with this view of treasured friendship. See the cross and see that you are his treasured friends. It's talking about an affection-filled sacrifice. It's the tender affection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, for you and your soul. It's the gracious disposition of God toward you and your soul. When you look at the cross, yes, don't think of it as a transactional deal. Oh, it covers my sin so I can be with God. No, it's friendship. It's being with God in a meaningful friendship kind of relationship that he has in mind for us. And that's the gift that he's given to us. This first proof is what I do for you. And quite honestly, we test our friendships by this very given proof that is given by the Lord Jesus himself all of the time we do this. If I'm out on the road at midnight and my car just breaks down and, and, and I'm an hour away from home, I'm going, I start to think through, who am I going to call? I don't have AAA. Who am I going to call? I'm going to tell you it's not a long list of people. When I think about it, well, maybe this person or maybe this person, no, this person, maybe it's one or two people, and you call them and say, hey, I'm crashed out on the side of the road here. I need help. Would you be willing to help? No problem. I'll be there. Give me your coordinates. I'll be there soon. They come. It's a soul friend. They inconvenience themselves. They give of themselves to you. That's one of the qualities of soul friendship, but there's layers of that too. If I call you at midnight and say, my dad was just killed in a car accident, You can't say anything more, and you hang up, and all of a sudden there's a knock on your door, and it's your friend. They don't say much, because what do you say? But they're present. They're giving themselves to you. This is where Jesus takes us, and what a gift it is that he takes us there. I came across a British publication. I don't know why this is, but I'm all of a sudden interested in a lot of British people and a lot of British publications. I'm just (laughs) having this aha moment along the way. I like old, dead (laughs) Brits, men and women alike. This is actually a contemporary publication, and they put out an invitation for people to define a friend. What does a friend mean? They got thousands of responses to it. It was really interesting. Um, There was a person who said, a friend is one who multiplies joy, divides grief. That's good. Another one came in and said, a friend is one who understands silence. That's good. This is the one that won. A friend is the one who comes in when the whole world has gone out. That's rich. This is a soul friend. They just come in. They don't have to have a lot of words, but they give of themselves to you in this given place. You were made for friendship, and you know a friend by what they do for you. Jesus is that example. And then the second proof of friendship is I confide in you. And this is not an easy thing to confide. So just take a deep breath and consider what the Father does in terms of revealing himself through the presence of Jesus. Look what he says. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father, everything that I learned from my Father, 
wow, everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you? Now, that's a risk proposition there. (laughs) That everything would be shared with you? I'm not holding back? You, You get all of me. That I'm no longer treating you like a servant. We're still servants of the king. It's not saying we're not. It's just saying you are now called friends. He's changing the paradigm of how we enter into relationships. And part of that is this capacity we've been given to be transparent and real and free with it with each other because the Father who created us has done that with us. That is, specifically, he has put himself in a place where he has shared freely his heart, his feelings for you, what he thinks about you, his purposes for your life, the plans that he has, not just for you, but for the world. He has shared all of it for us. What a gift we have from the Father to this given end. What a privilege to know him. Nothing is held back. And you put that in our realm of relationship that a soul friend is one who takes risks, that they're willing to move into that place of confidence, that it's a person who takes you into his or her confidence so that hearts, feelings, and thoughts, and purposes, and plans, I'm willing to share that with you. But you know, would you agree with me? We're a little bit like this when it comes to that kind of sharing. It's a difficult proposition for us, and it can hit a real tender spot because we don't always have people we feel safe with to do it, but the Father that created us is asking us to have relationships where we have cultivated that safety and we can share freely feelings and thoughts. Do you have that kind of friend in your life? Certainly you have friends, but even with some of your closest friends, it's interesting, it can be hard to really be comfortable sharing so freely from that given place. I mean, you might like them a lot, you may love them a lot, you may go on vacations together, you may even sing praises of them to other people, but have you entrusted yourself to them? That's what a soul friend does. They entrust themselves to another, and you can know it's a safe place for them to do it, and it's a beautiful gift when that happens. And so you find this reality of a soul friend that you were made for friendship. And you know a friend when they're willing to confide and share freely in you their journey and their feelings and their thoughts. And it just deepens this bond of affection that you have. There's a third proof. So the first two is what the Lord does for us from his side of it. Now he kind of changes the angle. And the third one is simply you love as Jesus loved. And this is no easy thing. We have this deal at Westwood, part of our DNA called the rhythm of life. God gives, with open hands we receive. With open hands we give away out of that which we've received from God, and God receives glory, honor, and praise and just fuels all the more goodness. God gives friendship. We receive friendship with open hands or not. Out of our understanding of the friendship that he's given to us, we Oh, with open hands, share it with others. And God receives glory, honor, and praise. And the pleasure of friendship is enhanced. That's what he's saying in these words in John 15. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Some people want to translate that as an obedience passage and it kind of like robs you of what the intent here is. It's not focusing on the obedience. Yes, it's a delight to obey. It's focusing on the command. There's one command. Love each other as I have loved you. Sacrificially, joyfully, purposefully. I'm there with you. I see you. I know your need. I'm stepping into it. I am for you and not against you. This is the gift of soul friendship that Jesus gives to us. Um, so how do you know that you're loved? When you start to love others the way he has loved you. Then you get the evidence. You know, when we do the Apostles' Creed and we say, Father, forgive us of our sins as you have forgiven us, how do you know that you're forgiven when you start to forgive others? If you can't forgive others, there's going to be a blockage to the pleasure and the joy. How do you know that you're loved? When you start to love others sacrificially, joyfully, when it's about their needs and not your needs, that's agape love, this love that is represented in Jesus Christ. That's the picture that you have, that we were made for this friendship, and you know that you... Um, are dealing with friendship when you're able to share the love with others that has been given to you. There's a fourth and final one just briefly I touch on, and that prayer is prayer. It's this, um, oddly enough, it's this idea of being able to ask, um, to be present with people, to pray. Look what 
look at um, Jesus says here, you did not choose me, okay, but I chose you. He chose us. I pointed you so that you might go ahead and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that you, so that whatever you ask in my name, in the Father, will, will, uh, will, the Father will give to you. So that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give to you, in my name. Have you ever wondered, why do we end our prayers in church after a meal, in Jesus' name, amen? Because he instructed us to do it. So we get to do this, name drop. We get to name drop. I mean, I, you may know some cool people in your life, but I know Jesus. I'm going to name drop Jesus. I know we get annoyed with people when, you know, you've got somebody like that in your life. They name drop. I know so-and-so. I have access to this person, and you don't. But we name drop Jesus. We all have access to the Father. Name drop Jesus. Ask. Have the comfort to bring yourself, your doubts, your questions, and just ask. Trust him in the middle of that. And that's exactly what we get with each other. A soul friend is somebody that allows us to ask. We can approach them. We have access to them. And they're usually glad and delighted that, that we've entered into this given place. A soul friend gives us that permission. They can ask. I just did this yesterday with a soul friend. I was having a day yesterday. Can I just say I had a day yesterday without giving you the detail? Have you ever just had a day? I had a day yesterday. I needed to talk to my soul friend. My wife was gone. I, I, I texted him, any chance you could talk at such and such a time? No, he said. Uh, but I could talk later in the afternoon. And we did. And he gave me 45 minutes. Oh, man, the pleasure of friendship. What a gift it is. You can ask. And they're delighted to give that to you when they're true soul friends. So there is a friendship famine today, let's be honest. If you're aware that this is something that you need and want, but you don't quite have and aren't sure how to cultivate it, at least you're aware. You're a step ahead of many people. What do you do with that? Well, I just want to say, would you take a next step and cultivate a soul friend? How do we enter into that? Let me just give you five simple steps to give you a path forward. And the first is simply... Would you pray daily? I put a focus in there. It wasn't pray about it. It was pray daily. Because this is so important. To the pleasure of your life, if you have it, oh, your pleasure will be enhanced. The freedom of your life will be greater. You're yielding to temptation and compromising the integrity of your journey. This came up in our retreat. Did you know that pastors, only 33% of pastors actually finish in their career in the role of pastoring? Some have other things that open up for them. Some have a moral failure or whatever because they start to deal with the loneliness of life and leadership. But when you have a soul friend, oh man, kiss loneliness goodbye. It just brings that intimacy. Pray daily. Go to God directly. Lord, point me to a friend who could be a soul friend. Already in your mind, is there somebody in your life that could be that? Start to pray that God would direct you into that given place. Secondly, is to stay patient, to be flexible. That is, um, they might not be able to receive what you're saying in that given moment. I mean, I would not recommend that you start out the conversation and say, hey, I had an idea. Would you be willing to be my sole friend? <laughs> they might go like, what are you talking about? Okay. Um, they may be too busy. They, they may be unresponsive. They may be uninterested, whatever the case might be. But don't give up. God made you to be in friendship with a soul friend. Make that a priority of your life. Be intentional around it. Step into that given place and allow yourself to move into the direction of showing up even if you're getting some resistance. Don't give up, continue. The third is simply be a friend. Give your energy to um, friending someone instead of finding a friend. Be a friend to them first as a priority. Whether they're responding to you, just take that risk. Be intentional. Be transparent. Bless them. Be with them, eat with them, ask them questions about their life. Have them share their story. And then you can probably have the table set for you to share your story. Not what the latest betting is on the games, which has become such a, a prominent feature of our life today. It's, it's taking over athletics, my fear is. That's another sermon. I'm not getting into it. I'm talking about pleasure right now, not the shadow side, the sunny side, that there's a friend that God has for you. 
but you have to cultivate that in, in the journey by being a friend first, then finding one, which is the next one, cultivating those relational rhythms. If you have a garden, you just, if you don't tend to that garden, it's gonna be weeds. You've gotta give intentionality to it. Put some relational margin in your life. Put a rhythm behind it. Every other Monday, I'm gonna make a time for dedicated friendship development and have lunch or whatever you wanna do. Just make it a rhythm consistently. Or here's an idea. Come to church 15 minutes early. Just a thought <laughs> along the way, okay? <laughs> in 15 minutes, you can connect with a lot of people and you can cultivate some of those relationships. I'm keeping up on the sunny side. Can you tell that? And the, and the last one simply is remember Jesus because we have a friend in... Yeah, that was really weak. We have... <laughs> We have a friend in, oh, we have a friend in Jesus, friends. Wow. He calls us friends. Isn't that something to behold? He, he has a story of friendship that is the cross. Step into that, yes, with Jesus. It opens up the gateway to a soul French that brings the best pleasure that could ever be experienced with friendship in life. And you have friends. Uh, which you can test by what they do and how they confide, but how you respond in love as Jesus loved you and how you step in with transparency and can ask. That's what he's given us and what a gift it is. Well, I wanna close off the message today with a little interview with some new friends in my life, but they're friends to Westwood, and if you've not met them, I want you to meet them. And I'm gonna invite Josh and Ashley Freeman to make their way up. We actually are gonna move this table and all of these things as well as the screen and create some space on here, but would you join me in giving, as they're setting all of this up for the brief moments that we have left together, and would you give a welcome to Josh and to Ashley Freeman? And come on in, friends. Oh, good. Good, thank you. Well, Josh and Ashley serve in Togo, West Africa. They're partners with us, but I want to elevate the fact that they're friends with us first and foremost. And when we first met, I was there with you, my first meeting. You're so young, can I just say that? <laughs> and we came together, and boy, didn't take long. Yeah. We went to the deep end of the pool real quick, <laughs> and we had a conversation at midnight one night, and I'm just saying, I'm not a midnight kind of guy anymore. I know you're young. You do all-nighters. Go ahead, have a party. I'm not that guy, but I was with you at midnight until about 2 in the morning, yeah. and we were at the deep end, and their soul opened up, and my soul opened up. And we, it just the bond of friendship with yeah. you has been great. Yes, they're partners. We give financial support to Togo. We've elevated that just a few weeks ago. They weren't here. Otherwise, we would have had them at that time. But I wanted you to meet these extraordinary friends that are serving the purposes of God in Togo. Just a little bit about Six um, Degree Initiative yeah. and its role and your role in it. Yeah. What, what is it that you guys do? So first off, yeah, I, we, we do get to be a part of an incredible team called the Six Degree Initiative in Togo, West Africa, but we represent many other people. So we have an incredible team of, of Americans and Togolese nationals, and I wish they were here, because yeah. they're the ones who, uh, they're the real deal, right? And so uh, when we're talking about friendship, I just have all of these thoughts in my mind. We've been in the, the States for uh, a few months now, and I'm just desiring to get back to our friends in Togo. And so we work in the birthplace of voodoo. And so historically, this was known as the slave trade, and that bondage is remaining in the spiritual bondage. And so we, we have a couple of photos that kind of picture what it looks like. And so what I like to help people understand is in voodoo, we just kind of think American context. How could we logically explain yeah. worshiping an image like that? That just doesn't make sense to us, but it, what they believe is, is they're not worshiping the object, but they're worshiping the spirit that indwells the object. Hmm. And there's a lot of ways you get to bridge that to the gospel because we are God's creation and the spirit indwells us. And so, uh, but that is the desire. And so we're asking God for 190,000 disciples in the voodoo capital of the world, uh, which is about 10% in this area of Togo. And uh, we are raising up leaders. We don't plant churches. We have leaders that plant churches and go into these areas. You're doing an amazing job. But Ashley, you've joined this guy. Like, why would you ever say yes going to Togo <laughs> and being with all of this kind of worship that you're experiencing in different places? And we've been there. I mean, wow, it's a wild ride, truly is. But then you meet this guy like yeah. wow how does that happen yeah. well God started working um, in my heart towards missions 
in elementary school. And so I moved to Togo in 2017 and thought I was signing up for a life of singleness. But then along came this guy. And Praying I wasn't signing up for a lifetime of singleness. <laughs> I uh, love that. She's a typical guy. Right there. Yeah, love yeah, so um, Josh was coming. He was going to be my new boss. And um, my leader let me know, like, I could come alongside and help him with culture and language and some admin stuff. But I was also hearing that he's a hammer. So he gets things done, but he might break them in the process. And I thought, Ooh, what if I get broken in the process? Yeah. Um, but we had a, a counselor come the week Josh arrived, and I saw humility, and I said, I want to follow that later. Oh, that's very good. Yeah. What's one quality about Ashley that made oh. you say, yes, I want to be with you? She talked about humility. It's her humility um, that I love so dearly, yeah. the way that she serves and lays her life down like yeah. Christ laid his life yeah. down for others. Yeah. We step into a partnership with you that really relates to people on the ground, um, indigenous leaders, who are hungry for leadership development. So you invited me and a team yeah. to come and teach on leadership. I wasn't real eager to say yes to that. I go, who am I to come and teach leadership in that context? Yeah. But going there, the experience, I, I understood better. What is the need and the opportunity as it relates to leadership? Yeah, I mean, we, we talk about the poverty of, of Africa, and there is a, a real physical uh, financial poverty, but, but we see in Togo as well, uh, there's a, a poverty in leadership. And, and our desire never is, is for, to build something that is sustained on us in America, right? But that they are able to be a thriving church yep. and sending their own missionaries and whatnot. And so a lot of what we focus on is leadership development, developing these transformational leaders yep. in the context of discipleship. Mm. So it's relational. Yep. And uh, that's, that's the idea is how do we raise the next level of leaders that continue to pour in and multiply themselves out. And that word transformational is the key. Yeah. In a transformational model of leadership, we make decisions on the basis of relationships a vision and relationships. In a transactional model, we make a re decisions on the basis of task and results. So we elevate friendship and relationship. And boy, was it a blessing. And we're going to continue to do yeah. workshopping on that subject this week while you're here too. Um, but a key to that is really the next generation because, wow, the demographics of this country and Togo are something to behold. Actually, give a picture of what the composition is of the population. Yeah. 70% of the population is under the age of 30. So it's a very young country. And if we wait till they reach a certain level to start developing those leaders, we are missing something yeah. huge. And so we have a big opportunity with the young people there. Um, and so that's what I get to do is work with our young leaders. And there's three girls at Grace Church that I've been pouring into. And they are um, amazing young ladies. They've been doing the verses, leading the songs. They've been doing everything besides teaching the Bible story. And I've been pushing and encouraging them. You can do it. But in our time here, it's created a gap. And so they've stepped into that gap, and now they're, they're doing it all, and they've already identified the next leaders that they want to start wow. pouring into. How old are they? They're 16 and 17 years. Okay. <laughs> Take that in. 16 and 17-year-olds, they're leading, they're designing, they're teaching, they're developing. The next generation of leadership that are 12, 13, whatever the case might be. No, God works through everyone, even young people. Maybe we've delayed adolescence just a little too long. Let's give our kids responsibility with the word of God and the joy and the pleasure of serving him. You're doing that beautifully. Let's just wrap up with a thought on friendship because mm -hmm. clearly it was very, very clear when we arrived. This was more than a partnership, more than yeah. you receiving dollars from Westwood and, and prayers, which we want to be about. It was a relational integrity that was really mm -hmm. deep. How is your look, uh, when you yeah. think about Westwood, we have our view of you, yeah. but how do you take us in? Because it yeah. can be a little overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it is unique. It is very unique, the relationship that we have. And, and I think what started it was, you know, vision and ministry and mission. Um, we talk about the things, our hearts were aligned in those ways, but, but what keeps it going deeper is, is the 12 p.m. midnight conversations that just naturally happen because uh, you love us yeah. um, and you love the people that we work with more than what we produce or perform, right? And so I think there's that. And then that just opened us up to continue to hope, hopefully pour in that love to Westwood as well. 
good. And you've been here all week, and that friendship you got to see firsthand when we arrived a few years ago, a yeah. couple years ago, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the first time Westwood came to Togo, we were going through transition, yeah. and our founding leader and his wife were leaving, and we were grieving that um, and going through a lot of emotions, but you guys loved us so well during that time. And I just think that really knitted our hearts together. So I asked them, being a friendship message, would you feel like the congregation is safe enough to share a quality or a need that you have that we could pray with you for? Yes, on partnership, we'll do that. But for you two, as young leaders in an amazing, challenging environment, yeah. how can we pray for you? Yeah, we, you talk about, you know, how's your soul? And our soul is always filled up when we get to be around friends like Westwood. And we're excited to get back to Togo next week. And... Uh, um, but yeah, we have great ministry needs, but um, we have personal needs as well in our family. Yeah, so Josh and I would love to grow our family, and that is something that we've been wrestling with and um, trusting God with, uh, but we would really cover yeah. your prayers in that. Yeah, it's a long wrestling, mm -hmm. a dream, um, and a hope. We can pray for you in that. Thanks for being willing to share. What a great time to be together. Isn't it great that God gives us friends like these? Join me in thanking <laughs> Ashley and uh, Josh. I want to pray for you. I want to invite you to stand at all of our sites as well. Join us for this uh, brief prayer. Father God, thank you for Josh and Ashley. Thank you for friendship. I mean, God, you chose to call us friends, revealed in Jesus. What a beautiful gift. What a pleasure in your right hand is the fullness of joy. We want that fullness of joy in the friendship we have with you, but the friendship we have with each other and even new friends. And because of who you are, it just opens up that deep end of the pool. Josh and Ashley, we feel that bond of affection for them and deepen it between us and with you as well. For their needs, for leadership, yes. For the advance of the gospel, yes. For a family. And they're not alone. Other couples here are dealing with that same tension. You're the God who sees us, who knows our need, who meets that need, and for that we rejoice and give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Again, would you join me in saying thanks. Love having you here. They will be at the, uh, um, the table at uh, Let's Meet. Stop by if you'd like to say hi to them. Our prayer team is here. If you just have a need, would like to receive prayer, please come down and do that. But hey, more the Lord bless you. Cultivate friendship with God and each other, and you will know pleasure. See you next week on sex. I know you'll be here. Okay. <laughs>